This is Twit. A question I get all the time, not so much from people who watch Twit, but from the radio show. Mm -hmm. Are cell phones safe? And you know, there's a brain cancer doctor who said, well, I don't know if they're safe, but I wouldn't let my kids use one. The World Health Organization put out a really kind of lukewarm warning, mostly like, well, we don't know, but maybe not. So I thought it'd be fun to send you down to the underwriter's labs where they test cell phones. Yep for radiation. Yeah. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, we, we got a great tour of their SAR lab and basically they're testing cell phones, they're testing uh, smartwatches, they're testing laptops, any sort of wireless device. They're testing for cellular radiation, but also things like Wi-Fi and just kind of any, any wireless connections. And they actually have these pools of different liquids that mimic the properties of human tissue. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, there are actually different standards all over the world. Um, and we had put together a little video package kind of showing, showing what we did there. Let's take a look. The smartphone in your pocket, the laptop on your desk. How do you know it's safe? Well, the products in your home, the things you already use, many of them were tested out by UL, an independent third party that tests out the gadgets that we have in our lives. We're here with Dave Weaver in the Specific Absorption Rate Laboratory, right? The SAR Lab, yes. The SAR Lab, and you are the SAR Czar, is that what I heard you call I, I run the SAR Lab, so yeah, I am the SAR Czar. Exactly. All right, so take us through uh, this, this whole setup you got here. You have some liquid, we have these robotic arms. What are we looking at and what does it do? Okay, so first of all, SAR is a measurement of how much energy a user of, say, a cell phone is receiving how much energy is coming into the head or the body. We don't just test phones, it's laptops, cell phones, watches, anything that's got a, a transmitter in it and is used within 20 centimeters of the body requires this testing by law. And that those uh, levels are controlled by FCC, Industry Canada, various government agencies around the world. What we do in here is measure those levels to make sure that they, the phones meet the requirements. So. We've got the robot, oh, we'll come to that in a second. But first of all, we've got uh, Sam. This is specific anthropomorphic mannequin. You can see there's some liquid in here. This is simulating the electrical parameters of tissue in the head. All right, so what does a liquid have to have inside of it to simulate a human head or the human body? Depends on the frequency that we're operating at. Uh, the very low frequency liquids uh, historically use sugar and salt and, and water, basically. The high frequency liquids so above three gigahertz, they were oil and water with an emulsifier to make sure they didn't mix together. The modern liquids, they're a chemical called tween, which uh, is mixed with different quantities of water to give us the appropriate uh, parameters for the liquids. Underneath, there's a phone at the moment, this is transmitting away, which uh, this is what we're testing. The robot arm here is maneuvering an antenna against the surface of the head on the inside and measuring the uh, electric field strength in the liquid once it's completed a scan of the area where the phone is, we can then calculate the specific absorption rate that's being uh, generated by the phone. And so the signals that are coming from the phone, what is it? Is it everything from like Wi-Fi to a phone call to text messages and Bluetooth? Everything. Uh, Wi-Fi, certainly. License band, certainly. LTE, GSM and all of those. Bluetooth, sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, if the power is below a certain threshold, testing isn't required. So about how many of these tests do you have to run for each device that you are testing? Typical smartphone with lots of LTE on it, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of tests. And each of these tests takes 30 minutes, 45 minutes, depending on the frequency that we're testing and the size of the device. And you're usually getting the devices well before we get them on store shelves, right? That would be nice. <laughs> uh, some companies have very, very tight deadlines. We'll see the device a few weeks before it's going to hit the shelves. Other companies are great. They'll, they'll send it months ahead and we've got time. Well, we always have time, it's just how much time. So you're, you're testing for global standards, uh, but there are differences. In the United States, uh, what do we look for in terms of uh, how close a device is to the body and where, and what do you look for in other countries? Okay, so for manufacturers in the United States, um, you're, you're gonna wear your phone against your body, most people keep it in the pocket, but you're supposed to wear it in a holster. And the distance of that holster, the separation distance mm -hmm. that that holster provides is specified by the manufacturer in their handbook or user guide. So some manufacturers have got a five millimeter separation distance, some use 10, some use 15. Um, so you, you really ought to buy a holster which provides that separation distance if you want to make sure that the, the SAR is uh, correct level. So most of us carry our phones in our front pockets or our back pockets, uh, definitely a lot closer than a holster would have it and definitely close to some very important organs for all of us. Uh, are there any countries that 
replicate that sort of usage in their testing. The European Union has recently come out with some new uh, requirements that uh, devices should be tested in accordance with the way they're used. And the European Union has basically said you should never have it any further away than a few millimetres, which is very imprecise, but that's what the wording is in the particular document. You also have uh, a section called the over-the-air laboratory, mm -hmm. and there, tell me a little bit about like what you're testing for in the OTA lab. OTA lab, um, as, as you say, over-the-air, is to assess how well the phone transmits, how uniform the pattern is as the phone is, is radiating, so that the the calls don't drop too often. Yeah. So it's basically signal strength with the network, whatever network you're using. Essentially, yeah. And there's also a receiver test to make sure that the, the receiving performance is, is good in all directions at the same time as well. Which it's not a governmental requirement, it's a requirement of the carriers, AT&T and Verizon. But it's slightly different for what we're doing here. Well Dave, thanks for taking us through all the testing you do when it comes to networking and wireless stuff for our devices. What else does UL do? UL tests a whole host of products uh, from mattresses to make sure they're not going to catch fire, to fire extinguishers to make sure they do put out fires. <laughs> um, you name it, we'll test it to make sure it is safe and is going to do the job it's supposed to do. We test thousands and thousands of products. The gamut is huge. Uh, we're, we're doing stuff now that we wouldn't have dreamed of doing 10 or 15 years ago. You know, I, 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 we, I really want to say how grateful we are that UL Labs exists. Remember the horrible problems people had with those hoverboards bursting into yep. flames? Yep. None of those were UL approved. Mm -hmm. The government made a law saying you can't sell hoverboards that aren't UL approved, and the problem went away. Yeah, and just to be clear, UL is not a government entity. They are actually a private, uh, privately indus held industry. company. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah, but they're global. They're one of the biggest independent testing agencies out there, and they test across different government standards. So if you see the UL logo on a device, it means that they've run it through their gamut of I'm tests. They're doing it. And it's safe not only in the U.S. but in other countries as well. I mean, it, it's it's a company that not a lot of people know about. But if you look at some of the devices in your home, you probably have a they couple. They all dozen. have that UL logo. UL, you exactly. better hope the, they all have the that fire UL. suppression system in my apartment complex has a UL logo. On. Yeah, yeah, pretty fascinating. We, uh, by the way, the UL is not the only company that does exactly this kind of cell phone testing. Before a cell phone can be sold in the United States, the FCC performs a very similar uh, set of tests, a, a subset of what the UL does. The UL yes. does a lot more. Yes. So. Are cell phones safe? Well, yes, uh, yes, based on what we know so far. So here's the bottom line. Uh, cell phones have been around kind of popular-ish for about maybe the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, the standards haven't changed much. Uh, there have been studies that have been done by scientists that show that uh, cell phone radiation uh, can actually damage human tissue, but the safety levels that are acceptable are 50, 50 times below what that level would be. So it should be super, super safe. Here's the question, and here's the part that's unanswered by scientists so far, uh, and something that uh, Dave from you all spoke to me about. Um, we don't know what it's like to have a cell phone in our pocket from the time that we're, say, maybe in middle school to the time that we're 80, 90 years, years old. And not to mention having a smartwatch on your wrist, a laptop in your backpack, uh, Wi-Fi in your home, all of these different things, right? You think about the dozens of sort of smart devices that we're bringing to our lives every day. Uh, and none comes closer to you are, and to very important parts of you than a smartwatch and a cell phone. So. Uh, Yes, it's safe based on what we know so far. The reason why the limit is 50 times below what has been proven to be damaging to the human body is because we don't know if radiation will compound over time and damage tissue in the long run. So uh, we think that they're safe, and the reason why the standards are so harsh is to hopefully ensure that. There, both the National Institutes of Health and the CDC uh, have extensive websites talking about cell phone safety. If you're concerned, you should read those. Yes. Uh, I think when cell phones were new, there was a lot of reason to be concerned. The type of radiation it is, non-ionizing radiation, doesn't have a history of problems, especially at that level. But now that we've had them for decades and have not seen, and this is important, you may hear anecdotal stories, but there has not been an increase in brain cancer rates mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. other related cancers. So I think while we don't know for sure, the evidence is increasing that, it, that there isn't a problem from cell phones. Yes. I'm not concerned, and I let my kids use them, and I use them. So far, the signs are good. It looks like we're but good so But who wears far. them in a holster? 
Well, th th I'm glad you brought that up. So <laughs> the the U.S. standard, the U.S. I standard. I keep mine in a safe place next to my heart. <laughs> The, the U.S. standards for this are actually uh, the highest in terms of radiation. So yeah. in this regard, we're doing pretty good. But the U.S. standards also ask companies, and UL and the FCC, to measure the this hip. as though it were in a holster but in your hip. nobody does which that nobody anymore. nobody does. In Europe, they actually simulate it in being in your pocket. Where do you which keep is more your realistic. cell phone? I keep it in my left pocket. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think a little higher may be better. <laughs> <laughs> now, I keep it right there. Now, there, there are some kind of basic things that if you look at the manuals that come with your phone, which nobody ever does, there's some basic tips. So using a wireless headset is something that most manufacturers recommend. And that's BS. I'll tell you why. That wire is, a, is an antenna mm -hmm. that conducts the energy from the phone into your ear. It is not any better. It, and, which is a good point. The holsters, of course, <laughs> nobody uses that. They nobody recommend uses. that as well. Bluetooth. So, is that better? No, because you're putting a radio transmitter and receiver in your ear. <laughs> I, I, I feel completely safe. I understand why people might. Uh, and I understand why there's reason to be maybe cautious, because mm -hmm. we use these a lot. They're you know, glued to our head a lot. Although, notice we don't talk on them much anymore. Not as much right? as we used to. And the farther, one thing to really remember, not only are these very low power, but the, f but the power the radiation decreases the inverse of the square root of the distance. So it, it cre decreases very rapidly. If you're holding a phone here, hardly any radiation is reaching any part of your body but your hand. Mm -hmm. So if I get hand cancer, I'll let you know. Now you might, you might ask, given that the standards haven't changed much over the last 20 years and that we haven't seen any evidence of this right. really being damaging and that you feel safe, why does you all need to exist? Why is this important? Well. Interestingly enough, Dave mentioned that sometimes they'll get devices from companies that are new to making hardware, uh, startups, Kickstarter projects, things like this for testing, and they aren't up to the standards, and they actually have to tell those companies to go back good. and do things again. So uh, That's despite good. this being routine testing, despite this being standards that every company should know and comply with, not all do, and so it's actually very good that things like UL do exist. Yeah.